the blindfold was taken off my eyes and I was standing totally, you know, that close to two big black vinyl doors and on the vinyl doors in big white writing on black it said, this is New Zealand. And I just pushed the doors open and walked into an auditorium where the lights were going down. And then up came the three screen installation. And it was brilliant. I joined the film unit in 1962 and during, from that period on, through the, the whole of the 60s and much of the 70s, uh, at the National Film Unit old studios in Miramar, uh, we had a heck of a lot of freedom to do what we wanted under Mr Geoffrey Scott, the manager. But we didn't always recognise how fortunate we were at the time. Our staff all loved New Zealand. They loved making films, and they were keen, young, enthusiastic, and most creative. Jeff Scott was the manager. Technically, he was the manager, but in fact, he was the executive producer. Mac Ashley, who was the technical manager, he went off on an overseas trip to Montreal when they were having their expo in 1967, and he saw the IMAX presentation. He saw various countries' presentations, films, when he came back, he said, multi-screen seems to be the way to go, and if we're going to do a film for Osaka, we ought to do one like that. And he talked to Jeff Scott, the manager, and they thought, yes, it might be quite a good idea. Uh, I decided the three-screen thing was gave us the best latitude for creative ability in presenting New Zealand. This whole business of Britain joining the EEC has had a profound effect at grassroots level on New Zealanders' um, desire to find their own culture because Mother England has suddenly disappeared and cut the apron strings and now we have to discover our own way through the world. And that's why there was a big push to take stuff to Expo that year. J.R. Marshall called a meeting at Parliament Buildings and seven of the Industries and Commerce people rolled up and J.R. Marshall turned to me and said, well, what do you think, Jeff? Do you think we ought to have a film? I said, most certainly you need a film. You want a film for this, it will do you more good than anything. And uh, he said, well, you've helped us in the past. Uh, I think we'll have a film. We said, we'll have a film, gentlemen. The problem for the film unit was that they could not do IMAX. They didn't have Panavision, they didn't even have Cinemascope or any form of anamorphic lens. So given the resources they possessed, a th three screen presentation was the way to go. The trouble was finding somebody with the imagination to handle the concept of three screen presentation. This was, this was my problem. Uh, and we had a young director who'd done jolly good work and his name was Hugh MacDonald. Mr Scott called me into his office and told me about the job and said I was going to direct it. I was a bit floored actually and I wondered what can we do with three screens that we can't do with one? And he said oh you'll find a way. We put him in charge of this and see what happens. I thought, well, it's too complex for me to do it entirely on my own as a director, so I wanted somebody to co-author it with me in terms of writing it and editing it, and I thought, Dave Jordan is brilliant in these fields. He's got the right kind of visual and musical imagination, and I thought he'd make an excellent collaborator. As we got into editing and the teething problems were out of the way, we realised that the best way to work was to actually work individually and take two separate shifts. So what would happen is I'd come at 8.30 in the morning and I'd work through 
the day until about 3.30 and Dave would come in then and we'd review what I'd done and we'd catch up with everything we needed to do. Then I'd go off and spend the rest of the day doing other duties and Dave worked through right through till late at night or until he was happy with the sequence he was working on. For Dave and me, one of the most complex parts of the editing was when we designed a split-screen nature sequence. This was a mosaic of shots of flora and fauna all linked by symmetry and setting. It took us at least a week to gather the elements we wanted and then to lay them out in a design form across certain areas of the three screens. And they all put their hearts into it and it showed in the film. You could see blood, sweat and tears and love coming out of this production. Magnificent. late 60s and 1970 and, and, and even staging something like Expo 70 was an incredibly optimistic act. And it was a huge initiative of the government to outreach to this market and we were immensely popular. At home we didn't hear much about Expo 70 except a few small articles in the papers but we knew at the film unit from reports from people over there that the pavilion was very successful and that the film was extremely popular. This was adjudged the best film there. Everybody agreed with that. It was the best film out. Most screenings were full in capacity. The seating was just arranged in tiers. So people walked along and they sat on a cushion on this tiered thing. We had um, red carpet covering these tiers. The cinema audiences may not have noticed the coveted red carpet, but they were certainly bowled over by what they saw on the screens above it. J.R. Marshall, who was the minister at the time, said, Jeff, I want the people of New Zealand to see this. Every time he saw the film, he burst into tears. He was an emotional man. It really got him, and, and he, he was carried away with this is New Zealand. So he said, well, bring it back to New Zealand. The New Zealanders must see it. I had made an arrangement with industries and commerce that when my expo was over, I would inherit all the equipment, thank you, but not to be sold. I wanted it. OK, you can have it. So we had all the gear in New Zealand. But I said, well, look, how are you going to... He said, you'll find a way. You do it. He said, we've got no money to do it with. You do it. Because of the weight of equipment and all the conversions required to the cinemas, the film was presented only in the four main centres. It started at Wellington, then went to Christchurch, then Dunedin, finally Auckland. They started from the cash desk uh, and went up Wellesley Street and round down into Lawn Street. That's how big the queues were. My first experience with This Is New Zealand was seeing the movie um, as a schoolboy. I was at Pukera Bay Primary School, 1971, so I would have been 10 years old. Everybody thought it was, it was really, really special and was so proud that this had been used to show us to the rest of the world at the Osaka Expo. It was like the, the moral um, and cultural duty of every citizen of New Zealand to see the movie. So there I was um, with my school class and uh, I went and looked at it at the embassy and, and really enjoyed it. And I remember going back and seeing it a second time with my mum and dad. There's no question that, that the way it looked on cinema uh, was an enormous experience for people at the time. We hadn't seen anything like that. As a 10-year-old, I'd begun to uh, play with Mum and Dad's Super 8 camera, so I, I was interested in filmmaking. Um, I was certainly amazed at This Is New Zealand, at the, the technical achievement of having three cameras, because I knew that it was three cameras and three projectors screening this you know, very special movie event. I was kind of aware of, of what had been accomplished, but I didn't have a, a clue how. It was way too technical for me at that stage to even understand it. This thing cut loose. And we were close to three screens, and they were wide. They were like one wide screen today, but there was three of them. And we were stuck 
there being bashed with a soundtrack that we'd never run into before. It came from the front, it came from the left, it came from the right, it, it traversed across the screen. Certainly this film had that kind of um, effect um, originally and I think it still does. The um, Sibelius but sort of became the national anthem, didn't it? I mean, you couldn't find a more perfect music score to accompany the film. Interesting how something written for Finland has that spirit has worked so well for New Zealand. The way New Zealand is portrayed in the film in 1970 um, is a very honest one. Uh, it's it doesn't have um, the hype that you might expect from a promotional film about New Zealand, and so in that sense. Um, it does resonate with my memories of New Zealand because of that honesty. It moves me to tears every time I see it, and yet I find it hilarious. There's so, that it has this kind of playful. I mean, it reminds me of Len Lai even. It has that sort of delightful, playful movement about it. There's things there that um, some of the Maori culture that we weren't that up to date with in those days. What a beautiful homage at the start to um, to Puna from the Iwi, the various Iwi throughout Aotearoa. Hugh and his colleagues at the time got it absolutely right, you know, paying tribute to um, to the mana whenua of Aotearoa. And that was a, a, a genuinely creative piece of filmmaking. Of course, when you look at the film, the countryside itself hasn't really changed. Um, I love driving around New Zealand, and it's there, of course, that the land endures. And what This Is New Zealand did is that it captured something of the spirit of the country, and, uh, you know, that's what's missing from any thing that happens today is that you get the facts, you get the news reports, or you get the entertainment through a soap opera but you don't get anything that reflects the, the spirit of the nation and the sort of the, just the vibe of the country. This is New Zealand it was a magnificent production, in, in my opinion. It couldn't be bettered by anybody.